And the fires that came, they came to us in the form of a fire hurricane. Winds were 74 miles per hour on the tail end of a hurricane and swept through our town of Lahaina in 17 minutes. And what I'm going to cover in this video is talking about the conspiracy theory that is um, associated with world events when they don't make any sense and trying to discredit those individuals that are presenting um, what they're seeing with their camera or they're presenting facts. So everything I'm going to talk about in this video is a fact and then you can draw your own conclusions or better yet, you can reach out to your government officials, you can reach out to your legislators, you can file complaints. Uh, but this is definitely a call to action because what's happened here in Lahaina, Maui is not just fading into the distant memory of people because it's not getting uh, covered in the, in the mainstream media, certainly not getting covered on the mainland, but it is of utmost importance that we talk about the facts and cover everything that occurred before, during, and after this fire so that you can start to draw some conclusions, hopefully as a concerned citizen of our country, a concerned citizen of the world. But the clip that I opened up this video with was Josh Green, the Governor Josh Green, talking about how this was a 17-minute fire hurricane. And that's simply not true. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about in this video is going to be before, during, and after the fire, and the facts, simply the facts. And then you can decide where you want to go with it. But I believe that we as concerned citizens must rise up, we must flex our muscle in terms of the God-given, inalienable rights that we have as citizens of this country and start to hold those accountable and start to unravel this mystery. Um, it's interesting, the more that I presented the facts of what I was seeing with my camera and my drone here on Maui, it didn't take long before I was labeled a conspiracy theorist. And I just want to pose the question to you, the audience, especially those people that like to point the conspiracy theorist finger, what's the definition of a conspiracy theory. According to Google, it's a belief that some secret but influential organization is responsible for an event or phenomenon. And I am going to say that it's really actually no secret. Everything is right before us on our very, in front of our very eyes and something that you can Google up and search up yourself. So let's go through it and let's talk about the different factual events that occurred that day. Now, I was there, I was present on Maui. I've been living in West Maui since 2011. My home is in Kaanapali, which is north of the fire. The fire got within, I'd say, a mile and a half or, or two of my home, and uh, we did get evacuated that night. But here are some of the facts concerning this particular event that I would like you to be aware of. But most importantly, I'd like you to please share this video because what I've noticed is that the facts have not been presented and it's not getting any coverage in the media and they, whoever they are, in the conspiracy theory, are hoping this thing will just fade off into the distant memory of everybody. And then whatever they are planning to do will be accomplished with any, without any hindrance from we the people. So here's the first fact. The first fact is that the video that you're going to watch at the end of this is Governor Green recently talking at the UN, and he was asked a specific question about the fire. And he never answered that actual question, but what he did say, first of all, is that it was a 17-minute fire, which it wasn't. That fire burned all day long from about, I'd say, 9 o'clock in the morning until after midnight. I was evacuated from my home. It was still burning in a field advancing to the north. So it was not a 17-minute fire, and that's going to be very important here in a minute as I explain some of the events that occurred that day. Had it been a 17-minute fire, might be a great excuse, but it wasn't a 17-minute fire. It was an all-day fire. Also, in Governor Green's video that hopefully you'll watch at the end of this, he attributes climate change as the primary reason uh, for this fire. Yet Maui County has uh, sued the uh, Hawaiian Electric Company calling it an intentional and malicious mismanagement of power lines by Hawaiian Electric. That is the state's leading utility that had allowed flames to spark. So there's a contradiction between Josh Green's narrative and what the actual Maui County officials have filed a lawsuit against. So those are, those are facts, right? The governor is saying one thing and the county and their lawsuit says a different thing. So is it a wildfire? Has there been an official cause of the fire? And what's the definition of a wildfire versus 
an urban fire that's burning through a city or a town. And there's some interesting temperatures that were reached and there's some interesting vegetation that didn't burn that you would normally expect to see burn at temperatures that can melt glass, uh, melt aluminum, melt copper, and, and disintegrate buildings. You would expect certain foliage like, like a tree or a palm tree to burn, but they didn't. And those are facts. You can look at the drone video that I shot day after the fire and you can see all the trees still have foliage on them. Right now the plumerias are blooming in Lahaina next to melted cars, which does not make any logical sense. But again, that's just a fact. Next fact is the initial fire source of the fire where it started in the field next to Lahaina Luna was 100% contained. So a message went out that day to social media I saw it on Maui now that said the fire, there was a brush fire and was 100% contained, giving everybody a sense of relief, like, oh, there's no fire to worry about, brush fire is 100% contained. So here you have an active fire department engagement at a brush fire, and then hours later, just a few hours later, that fire reignites. That's simply a fact. At that point in time, the fire took over into the housing development. There's absolutely no sirens that were, um, that were, you know, initiated by the county officials, by the EMS department. Uh, Hawaii has got one of the most sophisticated siren systems in the world, and when asked, the emergency management director stated that the fire, the sirens were not activated because they've trained the public that you're supposed to run away from a tsunami. So there are literally four tsunamis and they didn't want to activate the sirens because people would run uphill towards the fire, which of course doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever, but also the county website, the EMS website, specifically says that the, si the sirens are for in case of an emergency and citizens are supposed to tune into their radio or to their cell phones to find out the directions uh, to avoid danger. That's what the website says. Again, not in uh, agreement with what the EMS director states publicly. And then later on, the county does not go to retract that statement. He also says he does not regret, even though hundreds, maybe more, of people died in the fire, but the county does not regret it. And they, no, they, don't, they don't go back and retract that statement. They go, oh no, we, we, we do regret it. We, we wish we would have done it. They let that statement sit there, and then the emergency management director resigns due to health reasons. Next fact is that the emergency management director was not on island, but he would have a deputy that would still be in charge. The next fact is the mayor was uh, shown on social media around, I believe, 6.30 that night saying everything is fine, even though half of Lahaina had already burned at that point in time. The governor was not in the state, and also the fire chief was not on island. Those are all simple facts. Seems like a lot of people were not available uh, when they should have been, and the mayor, who's basically in charge of the island and this entire operation, at a very late hour in the day, was not aware that Lahaina Town was on fire. Another fact is, there was no power that was on. That night, about 4.30 in the morning of August 8th, I was awoken from my bed because I noticed the power had gone out, and so there was no power. So, one of the excuses they have for for redirecting traffic in a very constrained way, piling everybody basically into Lahaina Town was because there was down power lines. So the assumption is that you shouldn't drive over them because they're live. Well, the power been out since 4.30, so you would think when you have a fire burning all day long, there would be time to, to make the decision to, to cut or move the, the poles, but the, there's no threat of danger because the power had been out since 4.30 and did not come on for weeks after that. That's a fact. Um, there was no cell signal that morning, which is very unusual. You can see the power going out, but usually your cell phone is powered up by a battery, right? And you can still have connection to the cell towers. But the cell phones did not work. However, we were able to receive text messages for weeks. The ability to receive a text message never went away. Even after the fire, when there was no cell signal, you couldn't make a phone call, you had no data, but you were always able to receive a cell signal. As a matter of fact, there was an amber alert that happened the day after the fire, uh, or two days after the fire. And so the text message, ability to receive a text message never went away for the entire uh, post-fire, for, for weeks. 
Um, we were always able to receive text messages. So my question is, is why were there no text warning messages that were sent out during the fire? Because obviously they were capable of doing it because an Amber Alert went out a couple days after the fire. And then the whole time when they were trying to coordinate emergency services after the fire, they're flying an airplane around with a loudspeaker that you could barely hear Yet we were all able to receive text messages, but no communications ever came out via text. So we were in a complete communication blackout for like three weeks. The cell phones never worked. I mean, literally the day of the fire and for three or so weeks afterwards, cell phone coverage did not function. There was no data, there was no internet, there was no spectrum, there was no Hawaiian tell, the fiber optic. There was absolutely a complete blackout of communication and we were handing out Starlinks which was one of the reasons this channel became popular is because I was one of the few guys that had a small YouTube channel with a Starlink and I was willing to show what was going on on Maui and the mass needs that were accumulating because there was no FEMA, no Red Cross, no county organizations, no state organizations. It was literally just people helping people in the community, churches and, and different uh, uh, captains of boats and bring in supplies. It was a grassroots private community effort, but there was no government officials that were in there directing any of this traffic. Essentially, they were blocking people from coming into Lahaina um, from the from the other side of the island. So that's just a fact. Why did this blockade occur? Why? What was the secrecy? What was the point of keeping people and emergency services from coming into the community? when it was most direly needed at that point in time. And why did the cell signal not work? Matter of fact, you can see registrations in the FCC where the cell companies asked to operate at a different frequency. Certain frequencies no longer worked. So there was some kind of interference that was keeping cell phones from working functionally like they normally would. Why would it not be possible for cell phone towers to work once they were put up. These emergency towers were put up by Verizon and these other companies, um, but that didn't, didn't create a cell phone signal. There was still some type of an interference, and you can check the FCC and see where they put in for these special uh, regulations uh, to go to a different frequency. That's very unusual. Also, there was a TFR that was put in place right away, a temporary flight restriction. And it was huge and it was super high, like 3,000 feet. Normally those are only put in place to keep you from flying a drone or from flying an aircraft when there's active fire fighting happening with helicopters and airplanes. But the fire was completely out, essentially. Why is it that for, I think, a month, there was a temporary flight restriction where you could not fly a drone anywhere near the Lahaina Town fire way out into the ocean, 3,000 foot ceiling, and we even put in for a special exemption through the FAA, which is normally approved if you have a statement of work, which we did, but that was denied. We were not allowed to fly the drone to get any images. You couldn't pull over on the side of the road and stop to use your cell phone to make a phone call or take a picture or you know give tribute. You could not pull over on the side of the road. There was a complete media blackout. There was media that were not that, that told me they flew all the way over from New York, from California. They have media passes from these big organizations and they were not given access into Lahaina, into the burn area, not allowed to go. They were literally turned around at Ma'alaya and said, sorry, doesn't matter if you have a media pass, you cannot come in. Why was there such a blackout? But again, that's just a fact. It's not a conspiracy theory. And to this day, you cannot pull over on the side of the road two miles from Lahaina use your cell phone or take a picture. That is a constitutional infringement on our inalienable rights that is somehow supported by an emergency proclamation for a fire that's been out for 30 days. What is the emergency if the fire is out? Doesn't make any sense. Another fact is that day there was absolutely no water. So I have eyewitness testimony from people that came to their home in Lahaina that morning, that early afternoon to do laundry, to take a shower, water was shut off. Yet there was this distraction talking about water rights, which is unusual, right? It's like either the water is on or it's off. It doesn't matter who's got the right to it. And I believe that whole distraction was talking about maybe dipping water out of a certain reservoir that belonged to some other entity. But ultimately, no one ever talked about the logistics of why was the water shut off. 
I mean, how many times does the power go out, but you still have water? There's one time in my 11 years of living on Maui, uh, I started out on Front Street, actually, the first home I lived in, and there was a tsunami warning, and they told everybody, hey, we're going to shut the water off. I guess they would do this ahead of a tsunami warning. So I know there's a mechanism to turn off the water to all of the homes on the west side of Maui, because I lived through that during a tsunami warning. I think it was in 2011 or 2012. But ultimately, there was no water that was available. So the firemen did not have, like, hoses, and they're actively fighting this fire. There was no water. That's just a fact. I was told through another eyewitness that knew a firefighter that said the surface water wasn't working, then they go to the well water, and then the generator that, that, that creates pressure for that well water was out of fuel, was out of diesel, which they found was very unusual. Again, I don't know if that's a fact, but that's a story that I was told, but it had nothing to do with water rights. It has to do with the logistics of who turned off the spigot, essentially, that created the inability for the fire department or for residents to have water. The water literally shut off while residents were fighting with their little garden hoses, and now they're you know, bucketing water out of toilets to help fight the fire. So that's just a fact. The water was shut off. The next fact is that there was no evacuations. There was no door-to-door -door evacuations. Like I've, I've lived through tsunamis. I lived through the Heyman. I mean the Heyman. The um, the the fire during Hurricane Lane, and they had fire. I mean that policemen going around with bullhorns. You know, just circling the neighborhood, evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. There's mandatory evacuations occurring. They're going door-to-door. -door. They would create a blockade where you couldn't go into a neighborhood. At the time, I lived in Lani Apoko, and if you left the neighborhood, you couldn't go back in. There was no such evacuations that were done. There was no warnings that were given to people on bullhorns. It was mainly neighbors that were helping each other out. Again, another fact. Um, there was uh, <clears throat> owners were not given access to their properties after the fire, which is and to me is very unusual. Imagine you've got a safe that's got your cash, your jewelry, your diamond, you know, rings. Uh, maybe an urn that's got your loved one in it that you're hoping the metal didn't burn. You want to go back and get some of these items that you believe are fireproof, essentially. But no access was allowed to the properties. They were immediately cordoned off and were not given access. And yet the president of the United States was there a, you know, a few whatever weeks later. But he was in that area without any protective personal gear. He was just, a bunch of people were standing around. So they couldn't say it was like the safety of the thing. But I think just this week, they're now going to finally allow people to go back to their homes. But the fact is that everybody was blocked off from going back to their home. There was no accurate accounting given for missing persons or for the missing children. You would think a government agency backed by the FBI and every other major state, federal, county organization could easily do a accounting or a roll call of students, right? I spoke with a counselor that had been a counselor at one of the schools for 14 years. He told me that they were told not to call parents, not to do a roll call. They said they were not qualified. FEMA said, do not call parents. You're not qualified to make that phone call. But you would think in a course of a couple days or a week, you could easily come up with every teacher, every administrator accounting for the children, uh, setting up checkpoints like they did at all the neighborhoods. Come sign your sheet, Residents were coming in trying to get access to their homes. They could have created a checkoff list. How many people in your home? How many people? But there seems like there was never a, a quick, not quick, but a, a methodology for accounting to this day for the missing children, for the missing persons, and a real systematic approach to doing it. But it is a fact that this counselor told me that they were told not to do roll call, and that was a directive that was given by FEMA. Of course, did not want to appear on camera and say that, and neither did the firemen that wanted to talk about the generator losing uh, power due to no gas. Um, we also have unexplained items that were melted. You have cars that were completely melted. Now I showed some of these videos. I was labeled a conspiracy theorist, even though I'm just showing with my camera what I'm seeing. I'm not drawing any conclusions. I never said the words direct energy weapon or microwave weapon or you know assigning guilt or, or, or accountability responsibility for this fire. I just simply said, hey, look at this car. 
It has melted aluminum, it has melted copper, it has melted glass that has certain temperatures of melting points, yet the car is surrounded by gravel or the, the car is surrounded by grass that, that was this tall and burned. There's not enough incineration. These cars were abandoned without any fuel in them. There's just not enough fuel to, to help the temperatures rise to that point. So I'm not a fire expert, but after posting those videos, I was called by fire experts all around the world saying it would be very impossible to make a car burn at that level. You also have trees that were not uh, the palm trees. Palms are very, very, um, they're very flammable. So you have a building and cars that melted, but right next to it, you've got palm trees that did not burn. You have trees that still have foliage. You've got the plumerias that are you know, blooming in Lahaina town right now. So you have this unexplained burning of certain items and other things didn't burn. You've got blue umbrellas that didn't burn. You have blue cars. You have red cars that didn't burn. You have got blue objects. Again, just pointing that out, not, not drawing any conclusions, but just letting the camera show you what's happening. But then again, the, 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 the messenger gets shot. And all of a sudden, I get fired from my job at Keller Williams. I get uh, labeled as this horrible person that's doing these horrible things by raising money after I put up certain videos that showed some questionable things that we're just looking for answers for. But there seemed like there was a direct correlation between my character assassination through these fake videos and when I started pointing out the unusual things that burned or didn't burn in the fire or even questioning and auditing the sheriffs when they, they, uh, they wrote me a, a ticket for parking on the side of the highway even though I didn't, I pulled over and asked the question, why can't we park? Why can't we take images? Why can't we take pictures? And then asking them for their, if you haven't seen that video though, by the way, I'll put a link in the description, asking, you know, what are their names? What are their badge numbers? Why am I being detained? What law says I can't park here? What law says I can't take pictures? And then being cited the emergency proclamation that doesn't say anything about parking or not taking pictures at all. So there's an infringement of these constitutional rights. No one is taking responsibility for who's locking down Lahaina Town. There was a press conference where they asked the, the police, they asked the army, they asked the, uh, the county. Nobody could say who's under what authority are they keeping people out of Lahaina. So you just have all of these interesting questions that we're trying to uh, show you evidence of what's happening without being called a conspiracy theorist. Because in my opinion, that's just really like calling a doctor a quack. You're just saying, hey, your method doesn't work. We're shaming you. We're making it sound like you are you know, not worthy of, of communicating with or a worthy source or you're unintelligent. You're a conspiracy theorist. When in reality, you're just showing something that's the truth and points towards the truth and that those words have been invented as a way to discredit people and to bring upon social pressure that is negative. And that to me is the antithesis of a fair democratic system where the truth and with checks and balances and things occur for freedom of press which is what basically protects our country to protect our democracy and if you see that coming under attack then my call to action for you is you've got to do something you have got to do something whatever it is but let me get off that soapbox for a second and keep going down the facts we also have the fact that there was boats that were burned, right? Boats are surrounded by what? Water, they're in the water. So it's hard to make the connection between like this, this thing is burning and then these boats are way out. How could they all of a sudden catch fire? Like the bathroom in Lahaina Harbor didn't burn, right? That's a, it's an old kind of wooden structure. It didn't burn, but then all the boats burn and the boats are in the water, very unusual. There's also eyewitnesses that there was fire on the water itself. There's also eyewitnesses of bodies that were in the ocean. There was a, I did a, a, a video recently, I had to take it down from a, from a, coasty, a coast guard that said that they found bodies in the water. And after that came out in the video, I had to take it down. So it's interesting how the truth comes out and then it gets censored really quick. But where's the transparency talking about? There were many people that we know fled into the water. That day was 70 mile an hour winds. The oceans were gnarly. There was like these little mini hurricanes or tornadoes out there. There had to have been some people that, um, that didn't make it in the water. So, but there's been a, a lack of transparency or talking about that. Um, even though there's many eyewitness accounts, I've seen photos myself, um, but didn't publish those out of respect for the dead, but uh, ultimately that's another fact that needs to be dealt with. The next one is 
video evidence of trees burning from the inside. So I posted a video of a family that was escaping and in that video you can see inside of a tree the flames are coming outside of these holes that are in the tree. We saw those same uh, that same phenomenon at the Paradise Fire. So why would a tree burn from the inside? Again, just showing the facts of what's happening. Same with the cars that are melted. Also, asphalt has got a very low melting point, three to 400 degrees, I believe. You don't see any asphalt scarring around these cars that are completely burned. The asphalt's perfectly fine, but you have a aluminum wheel that's pulverized into dust but the asphalt is untouched. You have a palm tree right next to a building. The building is burned. The palm tree still has its palms on there. Again, not conspiracy theory, just the facts. The camera doesn't lie. Don't shoot the messenger. Just look at the facts of what you're seeing and then take the next step. Reports of, um, already talked about the bodies that were recovered from the, from the ocean. The police chief and his deputy both came from Las Vegas, obviously involved with the um, but the Las Vegas shooting, neither here nor there, but it's unusual that they didn't promote a police chief from within. It's unusual that he was able to bring his deputy, unusual that he got a pay raise pretty soon with a short tenure. Also unusual that he was also the coroner and the, the state statute says you cannot be the police chief and the coroner. Why was there never an injunction uh, to stop that from happening or a new coroner assigned? Um, constitutional right violations left and right, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of press, Nobody saying anything. Uh, even some of the uh, National Guardsmen are police officers on Oahu that even said they don't understand why they're telling people they can't park and take pictures. So there's not a cohesiveness between the authorities on the ground, between the sheriff, between the police, and between the National Guard. And um, uh, James O'Keefe did a wonderful job of exposing that in his video. I'll put a link in the description for that as well. Um, you also have July 17, 2023, Governor Josh Green came out with an emergency proclamation, an emergency for housing, which doesn't make any sense. Emergency is usually a tornado or a hurricane or you know a tsunami or a fire, but there's an emergency proclamation that pertains to housing that also suspends these uh, building codes and rebuilding an historic district like Lahaina Town is, just so happens that came out just a few weeks before the fire occurred. That seems very unusual. Again, just a fact. We also have lack of FEMA and Red Cross. Um, they were maybe at War Memorial. They were certainly staying down, I think, in the Grand Wailea in the Four Seasons. Unusual why you would have these FEMA workers staying in the most expensive high dollar hotel that is an hour from the west side of Maui. So what I'd like to do now that I've presented some of the facts surrounding the Lahaina fire is I'd like to give you some homework, if that's okay. I'm gonna play the clip that I've been promising to play of Josh Green recently at the UN, and I want you to just do a couple things for me, if that's okay. Number one, listen very closely to the question or series of questions that's posed to him to answer. He has asked how can subnational governments how can they proactively prepare? How can they proactively fortify against these types of challenges like the Lahaina fire? And what tools did he in, employ essentially to help Hawaii? And how can that put them on a path to resilience and achieve their sustainable development goals? I mean, she asks a lot of questions in a very short period of time. And I'm gonna say that Josh doesn't answer any one of those questions, which to me is very unusual. Usually if you're asked a question in a big public format like that, you would think you'd actually answer it, but he doesn't. He just quickly gives, to me, a very inaccurate report of the fire in Hawaii, blaming it on climate change, and also saying it was a 17-minute fire, and also saying that, uh, you know, there's the, every, we're all gonna hang individually, we're gonna hang together, and this is affecting, like, everybody, um, which is very strange. So. What I'd like you to do is please watch that portion of the video to the very end, and then I'm gonna put a link in the description if you wanna email Josh Green. I'm also gonna put in Josh Green's cell phone number so you can call and text him yourself, but I think we should start demanding some answers. And in order to achieve this at a very effective blast rate, it's gonna be very important that you share this video, that you share it on every platform that you belong to, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, email, 
text message, your friends, your family, because we need to keep the news alive about what's going on in Maui. We need to present the facts that happen because a lot of people don't know. I was recently on the mainland and I queried people in the streets about the Maui fire, people I ran into in restaurants. They didn't hardly know anything about it whatsoever. So the onus, I'm handing you the, the baton, as I did so many times during the crisis, it's still a crisis and I'm still handing you the baton to please make this video go viral so that we can start getting answers to these questions. We can start holding these officials accountable. We can start getting questions answered. We can start getting the right people in play, in motion. Because if you don't defend Hawaii, if you don't defend this little small town in the middle of the Pacific, the place where you come to vacation, where you've made memories, where you've gotten married, made babies, come to celebrate anniversaries and successes in your career and to get away with the toes in your sand and drink in your hand, if you won't defend Maui, you won't defend your backyard, I guarantee it. So I encourage you to please dig in, dig your heels in, get to work. You've got the computer, the smartphones, the world is at your fingertips. Instead of scrolling namelessly through a bunch of BS, let's start digging into the details of this thing and let's start mobilizing the right people. And a huge shout out to Joe Rogan for taking initiative and for paying attention to this problem. Also a UFC fighter recently brought the Bible into the ring and said, man, this fire was not man-made and prayed on his knees with, uh, with a fighter named Dan Ige. So it was, it's amazing the attention that is getting, but it's just not enough. We need to accelerate this into a massive, massive communication onslaught with the officials. So thank you guys so much. Please watch this video. Listen to it carefully. Slow it down. Listen to his answer. I'm going to put links to, in the description to the videos that I mentioned, but also to this green, whatever the heck it is. It's the, uh, the green, sorry, um, his name is green. Climate Change and Aloha Plus Challenge. Aloha Challenge, Hawaii Green Growth.org, Aloha Goals, Smart Sustainable Communities. I'm going to put a link in the description to that. But let's dig into what this means because obviously, if this is our fearless leader of the state and this is what he's presenting to the UN just a short few weeks after the fire, it must be incredibly important and something that we need to track down and figure out. Thank you so much. Much aloha. disaster um, it, it's really it's been horrifying to to see uh, what what you and your people have gone through we would like to hear from you on how subnational governments can proactively prepare for and fortify themselves against against such uh, such challenges could you share with us what tools you have in Hawaii that are helping you do that which put you put you on the path to resilience and also achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, friends and colleagues, first let me say I was uh, so pleased and honored to have our students from Hawaii welcome us today. Thank you, students and mentors. Uh, as you know, I'm a physician and a father and a husband. Uh, that's the lens I see these crises through. Uh, since the last time I was with you just two months ago, Madam Chair, Hawaii did suffer the trauma of a lifetime. A devastating wildfire claimed the lives of 97, at least, of our loved ones, displaced 12,000 of our people, destroyed centuries of history, development. It devastated the economy of that region, causing $6 billion in damage. And the fires that came, they came to us in the form of a fire hurricane. Winds were 74 miles per hour on the tail end of a hurricane and swept through our town of Lahaina in 17 minutes. The speed, the heat, it destroyed our local communication systems, our water system, and all of our above ground power infrastructure. And so I can tell you as an elected leader, I don't want to ever see this happen to us again or to any of you. So I'm here to give you a report from the front lines on cri the climate crisis and an urgent warning. Uh, we no longer anticipate the destructive events of climate change. We are now fully enduring them as a people and a world. Global temperatures have increased. 2023 is the hottest year in human history. Droughts across the world have become frequent and severe and prolonged. We've seen wildfires, not only in Hawaii, of course, but in Algeria and Greece, in the United States and Canada, causing air pollution, 
from the smoke. And this summer, smoke from 900 wildfires burning through Canada triggered air quality alerts all across the eastern United States. 70 million people were affected, including my mother. Meanwhile, our western states are grappling with the worst mega drought in 1,200 years. And for those out there who still doubt that climate change is impacting the world, note this. In the first half century, from 1953 to 2003, Hawaii experienced a total of six fire disasters. This August, we experienced six fire disasters. Ocean temperatures rise, they melt our ice caps, the marine heat waves threaten more than half of our world's marine species, which will stand on the brink of extinction. So let me say this very clearly, there's no town or city or human community on earth that is safe from this extreme weather that's fueled by, by climate change, which is why we must deliver on these sustainable development goals and you are champions to this end. Let me say this, the devastation on Maui has taught us that we have to urgently commit ourselves to a higher standard reflected in our Aloha Plus Challenge and the United States SDGs. So we can take action, we can move power lines underground, we can build fire mitigation uh, to protect our energy grids, but we have to back down on climate change. We have to use technology and human solutions as were described before me. And just let me say this, Ben Franklin said, we must all hang together or we will hang separately. That is true of climate change. We're in this battle together. We fight for the future of humanity. We struggle. We struggle to preserve our life here as we know it. And I can say this. I will do my part to bring American local governments along on this journey because of your leadership. We have faith because you have faith. Aloha and mahalo.